بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we reach hadith number 28 عن أبي نجيه عن الأرباد بن سارية رضي الله عنه وعذنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعظة وجلت منها القلوب ودرفت منها العيون فقلنا يا رسول الله كأنها موعظة مودع فأوصنا قال أوصيكم بتقوى الله والسمع والطاعة وإن تأمر عليكم عبد فإنه من يعيش منكم فسيرى اختلاف كثيرا فعليكم بسنة والسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين عضوا عليها بالنواجد وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور فإن كل بدعة ضلالة so on the authority of Abu Najih al-Arbad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu who said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered an admonition that made our hearts fearful and our eyes tearful. We said, O messenger of Allah, it is as if it is a farewell admonition, so advise us. He says, I advise you to have taqwa of Allah and to listen and obey even if a slave is a leader over you. Certainly the one who will live among you will see lots of differences. So stick to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly principled and rightly guided guided successors. Bite on to it with your molar teeth and avoid newly introduced matters. Verily every heresy is a going astray. Verily every heresy is a going astray. So this hadith, as you can see, is a, is a very interesting hadith. Because the companion over here, Al-Arbad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu, he felt as if this was a farewell advice from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he asked for more advice. So this advice that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is giving is not only pertinent to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, but is pertinent to you know, mankind till the Day of Judgment. And that is why there's a lot of important matters that we're going to be discussing in this hadith. So the first thing we need to know, who is Al-Arbad ibn Sariyah? And I remember when I first went to Medina, there was this uh, concept that we had amongst the students that we wouldn't use our first names, we would all use kunyas. Even though we were all like single bachelor guys, we like to refer to ourselves by our kunyas because we thought this was, you know, the way of, of, of the predecessors. So amongst us, whoever had like the most difficult, you know, Arabic name to pronounce, it was as if the, it was a sign of prestige. So I remember, you know, one of the brothers, he had the, the kunya, Abu Arbab. And I'm like, how are you even supposed to pronounce that, you know, in, in, in an easygoing way? Because you have the ayn and you have the dad in it, like very difficult letters to pronounce. So as I was preparing for this halak, I brought back, uh, you know, a lot of good memories from my time in Medina. Now this companion of Al-Arbad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu, he actually describes himself as Ruba al-Islam. He describes himself as one quarter of Islam. Meaning that he accepted Islam so early on in the Makki, in the Meccan stage, that he was only one of four Muslims as he describes himself. As for, you know, the authenticity of this claim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But clearly, he was one of the very early companions to accept Islam. And he stuck by the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very, very closely. Very, very closely. So much so that he was from the companions that uh, stayed inside al-Masjid al-Nabwi amongst Ahl al-Sufa. So that they chose consciously not to work and to stay with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so that they could benefit and learn as much as possible. Now Al-Urbad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu is a name that we've mentioned previously, particularly when we talk about fundraising. Does anyone remember the story that we talk about Al-Urbad ibn Sari? What story is, very, is he famous for? Who remembers the story? Anyone? No, blank faces. Taib. The story was as follows, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was one day collecting money uh, for an expedition. And Al-Rubad ibn Sari radiallahu anhu, he comes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I own nothing of this dunya except for my upper garment and my lower garment and I'd like to give my upper garment in the way of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So he gave away half of his wealth. But that's not where he stopped. Rather, he went to uh, a different part of the masjid. And as people were coming in, he was hoping that someone would come and give him sadaqah. So that he can take that sadaqah and give it to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa But as people are coming in to give their sadaqah, they're going directly to the Messenger of Allah. And no one is giving Arbad uh, radiallahu anhu any sadaqah. So that moment it got very painful for Al-Arbad radiallahu anhu. 
And he walked away from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, with tears in his eyes. Now a point of reflection over here is why is Al-Arbad so pained and so distraught? Like what is the source of his tears? And the source of his tears over here was the fact that he had an opportunity to do good, but he didn't have anything to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this moment of sincerity Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved in the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah when he says, That their eyes flooded with tears as they walked away because they found nothing to give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this really puts things into perspective for us that you know here we have so many opportunities of khair and we want to hold on to what we possess as tightly as possible. But some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were so desiring of good that they'd given everything away and nothing was left. And if an opportunity missed them by, then this is something that would upset them, that there was an opportunity for khair, but they weren't able to take advantage of it, so they became distraught by it. So this was one of the virtues that is mentioned of Al-Arbad ibn Sariya radiallahu anhu. Al-Arbad, he died in the year 75, and after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he actually lived in Hems in Syria. And that is where he continued to, to teach the people until he passed away in the year 75 after Hijrah, until the year 75 after Hijrah. So Ali Arbad radiallahu anhu, he starts off by saying that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam delivered an admonition, delivered an admonition. Now this is a very interesting point over here, the fact that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave a reminder. Now why is this interesting? Because if you look at the life of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in terms of preaching and in teaching, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, only had one set halaqa per week, and that was to teach the women. That was the only time there was a set appointment with a select group of people that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would go out and actively teach, and that was for the women folk. Whereas when it came to the men, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, didn't have a set time where he would teach them. But rather what he would do is after he would pray Salah, then he would take an opportunity to interact with the people and teach them through that way. Or number two, is that if he ever saw any of the companions doing something wrong, he would teach them right there and right then. So it wasn't a teaching style, it was more of a living Islam style. And I believe this is something that you know, is very important to bring back. Both you know, aspects of teaching are needed. We need ta uh, classes which will ta have a more structured approach. And then we need human interaction which has a more practical approach. Where people are shown how to live Islam and how to deal with real life situations like the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to do. Now, the commentators on this aspect, they say, what was it that made the Messenger of Allah وسلم, such a successful communicator? What was it that made the Messenger of Allah وسلم, such a successful communicator? So I want to ask you guys, what do you think were some of the successful methods that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used that made him a successful communicator? You guys have you know, heard some of them a lot of times, but what are some of those methods? What made him a successful communicator? Honesty. Okay, that's one aspect of it, but I'm looking for something more direct, more direct in communication. Concise. Sorry? Concise. Very concise. So the Prophet used to speak very short khutbas, very small sermons, very small admonitions, right? For those of you that attended uh, today's khutbah, you know, one simple hadith, he said, Al birru husnul khuluq, that righteousness is good character, right? And that was, you know, one hadith right over there. So it shows you that he was very concise in his speech, so it was very easy for the people to memorize. What is something else that we all know about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the way he spoke? Go ahead. Maybe wrong, but uh, just clarity in his speech. Yes, so he would not speak fast, and he would speak slow so that the people could understand, and he was very clear in his enunciation, right? So he would speak slow and very, very clear. That's number two. There's a third one that everyone knows. Fantastic. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, would repeat everything that he would say, particularly those things that required emphasis. He would repeat it once, twice, three times to make sure that the people understood the concept. So these are some of the fundamental concepts of communication that we learn from the Messenger of Allah وسلم. Let's look at some other ones. Let's look at some other ones. The first thing is that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he always believed in the message that he preached. He always believed in the message that he preached. So you would notice that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was always passionate and he believed in what he was preaching. And this conveyed a level of confidence in the people themselves. 
You know, often you'll hear someone speak and he himself doesn't believe what he is talking about and the, the, the listeners will actually pick up on that. That even though they may not consciously realize it, subconsciously, they're not going to be as motivated because the speaker himself doesn't believe in what he is saying. So why should the listeners actually believe in? This is another technique that the Messenger of Allah teaches us. Number five. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, would speak to them for a very short duration of time. For a very short duration of time. Right? So he'd speak to them for 5, 10, 15 minutes and not beyond that. Because he knew that the people would get bored, they have other things to do, their attention spans are very short. So the most effective method of communication is that which is short and that which is effective. So the Messenger of Allah didn't want to bore the people, so he kept his communication time short. So we're not just talking about the words, but even the communication time short. So when you learn about the Jummah Khutbah, the fiqh of it, you learn that the Salah is meant to be longer than the Khutbah. The Salah is meant to be longer than the Khutbah. This was the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. And he used to recite regularly Surah Al-A'la and Surah Al-Ghashiyah, Surah 87 and 88. And if you recite both of those together literally, I don't think it will take you more than like five or six minutes. So it shows you how short the khutbahs of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, were, so that the attention span would uh, not be lost of the listener. The attention span would not be lost of the listener. And number three, and this goes back to what our brother was saying uh, when he mentioned honesty and would tie it into a tangent of honesty is that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was a person of action. So whatever the Messenger of Allah وسلم, spoke about, then this is something that he would act upon as well. This is something that he would act upon as well. And obviously this brought about more confidence inside of the listeners that when they see the speaker acting upon what he is preaching, it increases the confidence in the speaker himself. So these are some of the effective communication methods that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used. And this is something that we can develop within of ourselves. That we should try to speak clearly. When there's a time for emphasis, we try to repeat it. We try not to bore the listeners. We try to make sure we believe in what we're preaching ourselves and act upon what we're preaching. And then don't have classes too frequently so that the people get bored. In fact, in Sahih Muslim, uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he used to teach his students only once a week on Thursdays. And his students would ask, you know, teach us more, teach us more. And he said that I learned from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we should never make the religion boring to the people. We should never make the religion boring to the people. So he used to teach on Thursdays for a very short amount of time, for a very short amount of time. Then he goes on to describe what that scenario was like, that day with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he gave that admonition, when he gave that advice, he says that this was an admonition through which the hearts moved and through the eyes were flooded. And this is a description that actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the believers in Surah Al-Anfal when he says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. That indeed the believers are those who when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned, their hearts are moved. And when the verses of Allah are mentioned, their iman increases. Their iman increases. So this is another point that you know, needs to be mentioned over here. That there is a time for academic teaching and there is a time for spiritual teaching. And the most effective of teachings is that which can combine the two. That which can do, combine spiritual teaching with uh, academic teaching. So the people can emotionally affiliate that which they are learning so that it has a higher impact on them. And this is why, you know, particularly inshallah when some of you become khatibs and when some of you give reminders regardless of where you are in the world, this is something you should try to focus on. That try to move the hearts of the people because when you move the hearts of the people, then the people will remember it. But if it was only the mind that you're engaging, some people may remember it, some people may not remember it. So the hearts definitely need to be moved as well. The hearts definitely need to be moved as well. He goes on to say, it is as if it was a farewell admonition, so advise us. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is foretelling his companions that look, a time is going to come where I'm no longer going to be alive and you need to be able to take care of yourselves. And this is why I believe this hadith is so relevant that this advice was not only for the companions عنهم, as the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is passing away, but it's also for us that live in a time where there is no one like the Messenger of Allah. We live in a time where there is no one like Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman or Ali or from the righteous Khalifas, right? 
So what is it that is upon the Muslim at that time? What should he be doing? And how does he make sure that he attains success not only in this life but in the hereafter as well? And it is this crucial point over here that it is as if it is a farewell sermon that should make us pay extra attention to what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has to say. So this is the first piece of advice that he gives. He says, I advise you to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I advise you to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll notice that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions repeatedly throughout the Quran, to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for our intents and purposes, when we talk about taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us at all times. To realize that the angels are writing down each and every single thing that we say. To realize that the angels are documenting each and every single thing that we do. And that on the day of judgment we will be questioned about our actions. And that each form of oppression that we commit, we will have to justify in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the concept of being conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. So you can relate this to the fact that you can imagine when you're at work and the way your boss is monitoring you, your level of performance is a lot higher. You're a lot more diligent. You're a lot more meticulous in the way that you conduct yourselves, right? And that is what the believer should try to aim for at all times. That realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having his deeds documented. So how do you want to react? How do you want to act when you realize this? How do you want to act when you realize this? And these are the effects of taqwa. And in the previous halaqa, I would believe is halaqa number 19, we spoke about the benefits of taqwa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases one risk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, grants these people paradise. That this person will only be, be do, do good. He will be protected from sin. He will be protected from the consequences of sin. And there's about 16 or 17 benefits that we mentioned of having taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now does anyone remember a definition of taqwa that we gave? We gave a very famous definition of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu of taqwa. It consisted of three components. A very famous definition of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud of taqwa. I'll, I'll give you the beginning of it. He said it is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that he is not forgotten. It is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that he is not forgotten. And he mentioned two other things after that. Who remembers? It's been a long day, long week, inshallah khair. So he says, the second component of taqwa. So the first one was to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never forgotten. That never one never becomes heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, it is to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to such a degree that one doesn't find an opportunity to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you're so focused on obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the time that you don't find an opportunity to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then number three, he mentions, it is to show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that one, uh, to show so much gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that one never gets an opportunity to show any ingratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one is always conscious of Allah and remembering Him, one is always obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and one is always thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he gives a, a different scenario of taqwa. He says, taqwa, or the example of taqwa, is when a person is walking upon a thorny pathway. So you're walking on a pathway that has thorns on it. So just like you would be careful with each step that you are taking on that path, similarly that is how the believer should live in this life. That before he does anything, he is very conscious of the step that he is taking, thinking about the consequences of those actions. Thinking about the consequences of those actions. Then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he goes on to say, and I advise you to listen and obey, to listen and obey. So those in authority amongst us, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he commands us to obey those people. And in fact, this is not just a command from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but this is a command from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, where he says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu atiyu Allah wa atiyu rasul wa ulil amri minkum. That all you who believe, obey Allah, Obey the Messenger of Allah and those in authority amongst you. Now just a brief analysis of this ayah in Surah An-Nisa verse number 59. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in this verse that obedience to Allah is unconditional. And the way we figure that out is, He says, Allah, right? So obedience to Allah is unconditional. Whatever Allah says, we have to do. Wa Rasul. So 
obedience to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is also unconditional. Whatever the Messenger of Allah tells us, we need to obey to it. Then when you look at the third category, he says, وَأُولِ amri minkum." He doesn't mention أَطِيعُوا before that. He doesn't mention obey before those in authority amongst you. To show us that those in authority amongst us, obedience to them is conditional. Meaning that if it is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we should obey them. However, if it is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they should not be obeyed. Then they should not be obeyed. Now, what are some of the practical benefits of why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam would mention this? You'll come to see later on in the hadith, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says that those amongst you who live shall see much difference, right? And the differences that he was talking about were very, many, were, were very many. Like the first groups of Islam, they were introduced during the time of the Sahaba. From the most dangerous of them is that you had the Khawarij that came, right? And the Khawarij, they rebelled against the general body of the Muslims. That they are the ones that assassinated Uthman. They are the ones that assassinated Ali radiallahu anhu. And it was these people that rebelled that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam is speaking about. That you shall see much difference amongst them. And one of the first signs that were indicative of the Khawarij is their disobedience towards the rulers. Is their disobedience towards the rulers. Now, I know in a, in a modern day context, it's very difficult to understand, you know, how can one obey such tyrannical rulers, right? We live in a time uh, where tyranny is prevalent everywhere in the lands of the Muslims and in the lands of the non-Muslims as well. So why would one obey rulers at that time? And this is something we're going to be discussing within Lahi Ta'ala. So what we need to understand is that the Sharia came to preserve, you know, five key components of life, five key components of life. And those components are, they came to preserve the religion, it came to preserve the intellects, came to preserve one's length, uh, sorry, one's wealth, it came to preserve one's uh, progeny, and uh, it came to preserve one's honor. So these are the things that the Sharia is meant to preserve. Now in order for these things to be preserved, there has to be a hierarchy of command that you've noticed in situations where there is no leadership, there is no one standing up, each person is doing what they want, then there's going to be chaos, right? Whereas when you have an authority, you have a reference point, someone that is leading you, then it's not guaranteed that you will not have chaos, but you will definitely have more structure with a leader than you would have without a leader. And this is why the Sharia puts have such a heavy emphasis upon having a leader. That even when you're taking a journey, you know, uh, of three of you, then one of them should be appointed as the Amir of the journey. One of them should be appointed as the Amir of the journey. Now, there's some very clear, I guess, understandings of this. So when the ruler commands you with something that is in accordance to the Sharia, you have to obey this, right? So there's no difference of opinion on this matter, right? The ruler says you have to pray, you listen to the ruler because this is, this is something that is accordance to the Sharia. Then you have scenario number two, which is the exact opposite. That what if the ruler says, that we're going to go against the Sharia. So you take examples of, you know what, in certain lands, our sisters are not allowed wearing hijab anymore. Our sisters are not allowed wearing hijab anymore. Is this something that they obey the ruler in? And the answer to that is no, because this clearly goes against what the Sharia go, uh, came for, right? It came to protect one's deen. And if the, the ruler is telling you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَلَا سَمْعَ وَلَا طَاعَ That you do not listen and do not obey in those situations. Now we get to the middle ground. Is that what if the ruler tells you something that is neither for the Sharia or is against the Sharia? Is this something that you actually have to obey? And you know, what is the conclusion on this? And you'll find even from like modern day scholars, there, there was like a, a great difference of opinion on this. Clearest example, traffic laws. From a Sharia perspective, are Muslims required to obey traffic laws? No? We have a brother saying no? Yes? So I think generally people will say yes. But from the most famous of people in our times that said you don't have to obey uh, traffic laws, was Sheikh Albani rahimahullah. Sheikh Albani, rahimahullah, one of the great scholars, in fact, the greatest scholar of hadith of our times, that our generation has seen. He is the greatest scholar that our, our generation has seen. He clearly believed that, you know, in terms of traffic laws, there's no obedience to the rulers on this. You know, it's for everyone else. And that's why if you ever, like his students that used to ride with him, they used to say that he used to drive very, very fast, very, very fast, right? So this is something that, you know, the, the Sharia was, was, is quite flexible upon. But the conclusion, 
Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he goes back to the issue of maqasid al-shari'ah, the objectives of the sharia. And he says that these laws, if they're based upon sound principles, and there's a benefit for the people, then these laws should be obeyed. Then the laws should be obeyed. However, if these laws are of not of benefit, then they shouldn't be obeyed. If these laws are of not of benefit, then they shouldn't be obeyed. So for example, you know, the ruler says that everyone has to wear yellow on a particular day, right? In this sort of situation, what benefit could someone get from wearing yellow? There would be no benefit in it whatsoever. So in those things that there is no benefit and the scholars recognize that there's no benefit in it, then this is something that the rulers are not meant to be obeyed on. Whereas if there is a clear benefit, like traffic laws, and I'll tell you a, a famous uh, a joke that I heard from an Egyptian sheikh. He said that uh, a Westerner, he came to Egypt and he gets into a taxi and he says, you know, I, I, I want to go to the pyramids. So as he gets into the car and they're driving and there's a red light that comes and the taxi driver just zooms through the red light. So the customer, he asks him, you know, what are you doing? That was a red light. And he's like, don't worry, I'm a professional driver. <laughs> so a second red light comes and the taxi driver zooms right through it again. And the customer is getting a bit scared now. He's like, look, you know, when the red light comes, generally speaking, you're meant to stop. So, you know, please, please stop next time. He's the guy's like, don't worry, I'm a professional driver. So now they come to another traffic light, but this traffic light is green. And then all of a sudden this taxi driver is stopping. And the customer is like, why are you stopping? It's a green light. And he's like, do you see that car? That guy's a tra professional driver as well. And he's about to go through. <laughs> So it shows you like, you know, the, the backwardness, unfortunately, in a lot of the countries. So the point being over here, the, what Ibn Taymiyyah was saying, that if there's a benefit in it for the people, then the ruler should be obeyed. If there's no benefit in it, then he shouldn't be obeyed. In some of his other texts, he actually adds a second condition. And he says that you look at the ruler himself. If the ruler is known to be a just ruler, then you obey the just ruler. But if the ruler is known to be not to be just, then you do not have to obey the unjust ruler. You do not have to obey the unjust ruler. And this is only about the third category that we're speaking about. And those matters that the Sharia is not explicit about. That's not clearly halal, not clearly haram. What do you do in those matters? Then Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, you look at number one, the ruler himself. If he's just, you obey the just ruler. If he's unjust, you don't obey the unjust ruler. Number two, you look at, is there benefit in it for the people? If there's a benefit in it for the people, you obey. If there's no benefit in it for the people, then you don't obey. Now, why would the Sharia command this? From a practical standpoint, you'll see this all over the world, that when people try to rebel against the rulers, that there's always some sort of chaos that is taking place. Some sort of looting that will be taking place, some sort of killing that will be taking place, some sort of you know, anarchy that's going to be taking place where the people no longer feel safe. So even while you have dictators, while life would may be difficult, then at least certain elements of safety would be found. Whereas when people start to rebel and they don't have a you know, conscious plan of how to implement a, a just rulership at that time, then that just leads to further chaos. That just leads to further chaos. And I remember when the Arab Spring was initially taking place, this is something that a, a lot of Muslims felt you know, very emotional about and very supportive of. And I agree, you know, like when dictators are, are removed, this is something to be happy about. But that is only half of the battle. The second half of the battle is putting into power people that are deserving of power, right? We need to put in that just rulership. And that is, a, that is why I believe that the Sharia is so adamant that up until you have a play in mind that you know it can be put into play, then even living in, in a form of dictatorship may be better for the people. I didn't say absolutely better, I said it may be better for the people. And this is something you know, we need to reflect upon that you know, inshallah the 200,000 people that or so that have died in Syria, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them as, as shuhada. But is it worth it right now at this point? That rebellion started, yes, they wanted to get Bashar out. And of course, he's a very tyrannical ruler that is not even Muslim. He has a, a deen completely different from Islam. But are those 200 lives worth it? I guess we'll come and see, you know, eventually when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants victory to the Syrian people and we pray that it is soon. Taib. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he then goes on to say, even if it is a slave leader over you. And in another narration, he says, even if it is an Abyssinian slave that is appointed over you. What is the significance of this phrase? The significance of this phrase, to summarize it, is that number one, it is not permissible for a slave to be a leader, right? 
Because just by definition, a slave has a master over him. So how can a slave ever be the leader of a people? So the Messenger of Allah is using this analogy over here, that even if the lowest form of society becomes an authority over you, they find a way to become into power, then they need to be obeyed. That we cannot have a, a class system in play. Oh, just because I am Arab and you're not Arab, I don't have to obey you. The Messenger of Allah is teaching us that obedience should be conditional to Islam. That when people tell us to do things that are good, we obey. When people tell us to do things that are bad, we don't obey. And this obedience, it needs to take place, even if from our perspective, they're the lowest forms of society. The lowest forms of society, who at that time were the slave class. Were the slave class. Something important to understand, that when we talk about the issue of Khilafah, from an Islamic perspective, the Khilafah always needs to be the Qur from the Quraysh. It always needs to be from the Quraysh. The Prophet Wasallam he clearly says, Al-A'immatu min Quraysh. That the leaders of the Muslims will always be from the Quraysh. And this is something that the Messenger of Allah Wasallam and Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala through the Messenger of Allah Wasallam have ordained. And that is why you'll see that the predominant, when there's only a one Khalifa system, that one Khalifa should be from the Quraysh. However, you'll notice that at times we had multiple Khilafa systems, right? So when you looked at the, uh, when the Muslims were in Andalus, they had their own Khalifa and their own ruler over there. We had their own Umayyad Khalifa, we had their own Abbasid Khalifa, and there was a whole bunch of, you know, different Khulafa at that time. But when there's only one Khalifa, one predominant Khalifa that you will call Amir al muminin then this Khalifa needs to be from the Quraysh. This Khalifa needs to be from the Quraysh. Now the Messenger of Allah وسلم, goes on to say, certainly the one who lives among you will see a lot of differences. Now, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he says this, مَنْ يَعِيشْ مِنْكُمْ فَسَيَرَى اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا That whoever amongst you lives shall see much difference. Now in the Arabic language, there's two ways to say this. You can say سَيَرَى and you can say سَوْفَ يَرَى the difference between the two, that when the scene is used, it means in the very near term future. Whoever lives amongst you in the very near future shall see much differences. Whereas when sofa is used, sofa yara ikhtilaf and kathira, it means in the distant future, then you will see much differences. So here the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is foretelling actually what is going to be taking place in the Muslim Ummah at that time. And this is towards the end of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You already see, you know, the emerging of the Khawarij during that time. Dhul Khawaisara, you know, who was like the, the founding father of the, of the Khariji ideology. He lived during the time of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And during the time of the Sahaba, right after the death of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you saw them, you know, emerge and become a very, very powerful group. So much so that they, they fought the Muslims in, in the battle of Naharwan, right? And the interesting thing, and if we'll just take a moment to, to talk about this, is that if you look at the, the battle of, of Nahrawan where the, the Muslims fought the Khawarij, one thing that you notice about the Khawarij is that the way that they're described is that they were from the most righteous of people, that you could not compete with the recitation of the Qur'an, you could not compete with their fasting, you could not compete with their praying at night, that they were known to be very righteous people. But what was their downfall? Who knows what their downfall was? What was their downfall? It could be pride. Not pride, something more than that, something more obvious than that. Go ahead. Extreme. By definition, the Khawarij were extreme, yes. But there's a particular downfall that they had that we're missing over here. Shallowness? Shallowness? No, more than that. Something more obvious. So we can't compete with their ibadah, but why is it that the Sahaba didn't join them? None of the Sahaba ever became from the Khawarij. Why was that? Let's go with against the Sharia. What does that mean? How does one know what is Sharia and what is not? Go ahead. Their understanding was incomplete. Their understanding was incomplete or they didn't have knowledge, right? So this group of people, the Khawarij, and this is like a reoccurring trend throughout history, is that while they may have had righteous people amongst them, they never had any people of knowledge amongst them. That is why you saw none of the Sahaba become from the Khawarij. Even in this day and age, when you look at ISIS, you'll find people that, you know, on the appearance, they seem like righteous people. People that may have memorized the Quran, people that, yes, they pray, and, and people, you know, you'll see uh, attributes of righteousness. But one thing you will not see amongst them is signs of scholarship. You will not find scholars amongst them. Why? 
Because as soon as a person of knowledge comes into play, then all of the things that they stand for are no longer valid, right? This concept of, of just killing people based upon sin, the concept of killing people to establish an Islamic state. I mean, from a hypothetical standpoint, if you keep killing people, how are you going to establish a state that has no people in it, how, right? And if you, you know, are trying to establish an Islamic state, one of the important concepts of a state is that you're meant to have public relations with the people around you. If you keep destroying those relationships, what type of Islamic state are you meant to have, right? So it shows you that throughout history, one of the recurring trends that you will find is that there have never been any people of knowledge. And this is one of their downfalls, that people who end up joining groups like ISIS, these are people that are, are very you know, enthusiastic about their faith, but unfortunately have very minimal understanding about their faith, right? And the more a person increases in knowledge, the more clearly deviance becomes uh, open to them or seen to them. So this is what the Messenger of Allah is saying over here, that those amongst you that live will see these much differences. And those differences again were like the likes of the killing of Uthman, the likes of the killing of Ali, the debates with the Khawarij, the fighting of the Khawarij, all of that took place. So now here the Messenger of Allah is saying that if you see much differences, what should you do at that time? What should you do upon that time? So he says, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي Upon you is to follow my sunnah. Now one may think over here, you know, when we think of the term sunnah, we think about the ways that we eat, the ways that we sit, the ways that we dress. How would that save the ummah at that time? How is that meant to be a guide? That is where the mistake is over here. That the term sunnah over here does not just mean the way the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, conducted himself in terms of his physical appearances and his conduct in terms of interaction. But the sunnah over here means return to the religion as a whole. Return to the religion as a whole. And that is why when you see the early books in Islam that were written on Islamic creed, books that are written on, in Aqidah, they were called Usul al-Sunnah, and they were called as sunnah right? Because they were referring to the religion of Islam as a whole. So the Messenger of Allah is saying that in those times of differences, it is at those times that you need to stick to the principles of Islam. Don't abandon your principles of Islam at that time. And the second thing that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءَ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِينَ And upon you is also to follow the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. It's upon you also to follow the sunnah of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. So now this concept of rightly guided uh, successors, is it just referring to Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali? Or does it encompass more than that? Does it encompass more than that? So there are many, many opinions on, on this matter, and I'll share the most predominant opinions with you. So the most predominant opinions, and the most common opinion, is that when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, mentions Khulafa al-Rashidin, it is referring to the famous, famous four, four Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Uthman, uh, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali radiallahu anhum. The majority held this opinion, that they are the Khulafa al-Rashidin. Opinion number two said, it is these four, and number five being Hassan radiallahu an. Number five being Hassan radiallahu an. Because he was the Khalifa for six months after the death of Ali radiallahu an. He was the Khalifa for six months after the death of Ali radiallahu an. Opinion number three. They said it is not Al Hassan over here, but it is the four. And then Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz. This is opinion number three. So the four famous Khulafa with Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Now, opinion number four is a combination of all of the opinions before it. So you had the famous four Khulafa, Al Hassan and Umar bin Abdul Aziz. So these are three opinions that are, uh, are, are on one side. And then on the other side, you have another opinion that said, what is the significance of being rightly guided? And what does rightly guided actually mean? So the significance of rightly guided and what is rightly guided actually means is that these are people that stuck to the principles of Islam. They stuck to the call of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what is there to indicate that this sticking to the call of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to the principles of Islam is only included within the first four? And this argument is actually a very strong one, that there's nothing particularly to indicate that it is restricted to those four alone. So Ibn Taymiyyah uh, and modern day scholars like Sheikh Umar al-Ashkar, they argue that when the term Khulafa al-Rashidin is mentioned, that it includes anyone that follows the path of Islam properly. So anyone that follows the path of Islam properly, he is to be considered from the Khulafa al-Rashidin. 
Because the significance over here is not because of the individuals themselves, but rather it is due to the fact that these people followed the principles of Islam. And anyone is capable of doing that. And anyone is capable of doing that. So that is discussion number one about this. Discussion number two about this is if the four khulafa, and from them Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman, and Ali radiallahu anhu, if they agree upon a matter, does that become evidence within the sharia within of itself? Right? So all four of the khulafa, they agree upon a particular matter. Does it become a form of evidence within of itself? And this is something that the scholars of Wasul al-Fiqh discussed, and we'll just summarize it over here. And the answer to that is no, that it doesn't become a proof just because the four khulafa agreed upon something. Now obviously this is very, very hypothetical that they would agree upon something that is in opposition to what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Right? So it's a very hypothetical discussion. And that is why for hypothetical discussion's sake, we will say that no, it is not a proof within of itself. But rather the proof will always be what the Prophet ﷺ said, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and what all of the scholars uh, agreed upon. So if the four khulafa agreed upon something, yet other sahabas are disagreeing with them, then their opinion would not be held as a proof within of itself. Their opinion would not be held as a proof within of itself. As great as they were, it would not constitute a proof within of itself. But rather all of the companions would need to agree upon it. All the companions would need to agree upon it. And in the one scenario where it would become a proof, and this is again just for, for mentioning Usul al-Fiqh principles, if the four khulafa mentioned something, and then none of the other companions disagreed, then this is something that we would call ijma sukuti. This is something that we would call a silent consensus amongst the Sahaba. And it's a silent consensus amongst the Sahaba that would be considered a proof. It is a silent consensus amongst the Sahaba that would be considered a proof. Now, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes on to say, عَلَيْهَا بِالنَّوَاجِذِ That bite onto it with your molar teeth. So your molar teeth are the teeth in the back. That when you bite onto something with it, it's like a you know, very strong grip. It's very difficult to let go of. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that in times of ikhtilaf, you need to hold on to knowledge. That the only way you will be protected from fitna is to hold on to knowledge, to hold on to the principles of Islam. And that is why it is very, very important that in times of fitna, one cannot become over-emotional. But rather, one needs to think clearly with their head based upon the texts and based upon evidences from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Sticking to Islamic principles at that time. That hold on to it with your molar teeth. And that is the only way you will be protected. Now we move on to our last discussion in the hadith, and that is the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, and avoid newly introduced matters. Avoid newly introduced matters. So this goes into a discussion of bid'ah. It goes into a discussion of bid'ah. And firstly, we talk about the role of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam come to teach us about our religion? Or did the Messenger of Allah come to teach us about all aspects of life? And is there a possibility that the Messenger of Allah could err in a matter of worldly discussion? So those are like the three discussions that we're going to have. So the role of the Messenger of Allah in a very general sense is that his primary role was to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is to teach us our religion. And anything that is a part of our faith part of it is human interaction and conduct, then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to teach us those things, and the Messenger of Allah was the best of example in those things. So when it came to the deen, when it came to character, there was no one better than the Messenger of Allah, and he was perfect in that aspect. He was perfect in that aspect. However, when it came to particulars of this dunya, so for example, how to irrigate water, how to plant seeds, and those sort of things that the people were doing at that time. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam clearly says, Antum a'lamu bi amri dunyakum. That you are more knowledgeable of, the, of your affairs of this world. Right? So some people were planting some seeds. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi told them, Look, don't harvest them this way, but harvest them another way. A year or so passes by, these people come complaining, Oh Messenger of Allah, you told us to do it in such and such way, but it destroyed our harvest. And this is when the Messenger of Allah he said, Antum a'lamu bi amri dunyakum, that you are more knowledgeable of your affairs of this world. So if there's something of this dunya that you have knowledge of, then 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not going to be you know, dwelling into those matters. The dunya is like a, a completely different subject from what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to teach in a primary perspective. Primary perspective was always about the deen. Now, in the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we need to understand that the deen was completed. That in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any laws and regulations that we needed, any principles that we needed to be successful in this dunya or in the akhirah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us those things. This is seen in the verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَةِ وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ That today I have perfected your religion for you and have perfected and have completed my favor upon you and have chosen and am pleased with Islam as your way of life. This verse when it was revealed, it was revealed in the last Hajj of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at Arafah. And no more commandments came down after that time. No more commandments came down after that time. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he heard this verse, he started to cry. He started to cry because he realized that once something reaches its perfection, then it has nowhere to go except for down. So once the deen has been completed, the role of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is complete, meaning that he's going to be leaving the, the dunya soon. And once the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa leaves the dunya, then Umar knew that the fitna would come out, that the fitna would come out, right? So the religion was completed during the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says, clearly says. Now let us look at some of the interactions of the companions. Let us look at some of the interactions of the companions. Abu Dharr radiallahu anhu, he said that there's not a bird that flaps its wings except that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave us some knowledge of it. Except that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa gave us some knowledge of it. Meaning that everything that we needed to know, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa taught it to us. With Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu, a man came to Salman and he says, your Prophet has even taught you how to wipe your backsides after you go to the bathroom. So he's trying to put Salman down that, look, this is the role of your Prophet, that he came to teach you how to wipe your backsides. But Salman radiallahu anhu, he took this as a source of pride. He says, yes, he not only did he taught us how to wipe our backsides, but he also taught us that when we go to the bathroom, we shouldn't face the Qibla. And that we, when we clean ourselves, we should clean ourselves an odd number of times. Meaning that Islam is not just a religion that is, you know, worshipped, uh, worshipping Allah in the Masajid. But it encompasses all aspects of our lives. It encompasses all aspects of our lives. And this is what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came for. So the fact that the Messenger of Allah taught us these things, it shows us that he, comp he taught us everything that was needed. And this is why the Messenger of Allah clearly said that anything that you needed to be known for in terms of good, I have taught it to you. And anything that was harmful to you or dangerous to you, then I have taught you to stay away from it. I have taught you to stay away from it. <coughs> so now we get into the de definition of bid'ah. What do we, we get into the definition of bid'ah. And is there such a thing as bid'ah hasana? Is there such a thing as a good bid'ah? So the first thing we want to start our discussion with is a statement of Imam Malik. Imam Malik, uh, rahimahullah, he says, if someone innovates something in the religion of Islam, that he believes is good, he has thereby alleged that the Prophet ﷺ has been disloyal to his message. And that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, today I have completed your religion for you. So meaning that if anyone says that there is room for innovation in Islam, then it is as if he is proclaiming that the Messenger of Allah did not fulfill his message. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly said that today your religion has been perfected and it has been complete. Meaning that there is no room for innovation. So now when you look in some of these books of the past and they talk about you know, certain bid'ahs being compulsory. That there are certain aspects of bid'ah, certain aspects of innovation that were compulsory. What exactly did those statements mean? And you have the famous narration of Umar radiallahu anhu that when the uh, Salat al-Taraweeh was re-established, he said, what a good innovation this is. How do we understand those uh, situations? So firstly, we need a definition of bid'ah. Firstly, we need a definition of bid'ah. And the definition we're going to share is going to have two key components to it. Two key components to it. So the first thing, it is any ritual act 
that is not based in the Quran and Sunnah and that is done as an act of worship. So it is any ritual act that we will do that is not found in the Quran and Sunnah that we use as an act of worship to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first part of the definition. It is a ritual act that is done, not found in the Quran and the Sunnah, used as, used as an act to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second part of the definition is any worldly act that a person performs claiming that it is pleasing to Allah while there's nothing in the Quran and Sunnah to support that claim. While there's nothing in the Quran and the Sunnah to support that claim. So this is any worldly act that a person says that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the two ways that you will find out what a bid'ah is. This is the two ways that you will find out what a bid'ah is. So in terms of our discussion, when we talk about bid'ah, a lot of the scholars of the past, when they spoke about bid'ah, they include the dunya and they include the deen. But we notice that when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he says, وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And all innovation is heresy and is evil. He's not referring to the innovations of this world. He's not referring to the innovations of this world. But rather he's referring to the innovations that are referring to in this deen. Now how do we know that it was only referring to the deen and not to the dunya innovations? How do we know that? Who can tell us? Sorry? The modern science is like a big innovation. This is it is. But how do we know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not criticizing modern science and technology? How do we know that he's not criticizing it? That's my question. I just have one example. Like in the battle when some other parts, he told them big up trench. Fantastic. That was, a, that was an innovation that was never done before, but he approved of it. So he obviously was talking about the matters, not the Okay, good. So that's one practical example during the time uh, of the Battle of Khandak. The Muslims didn't have the knowledge of building trenches upon, around their properties, right? So Salman taught them that, look, this is what we used to do in Persia. We used to build trenches around our property, and this would prevent from people coming in. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu he approved of this. And this was in the strategy of war, and it was not in the deen. But I need something more explicit. I need something more explicit. Because he said, uh, you know more of the dunya than me. Sorry? Yeah, you know more of the dunya than me. So that's another example that in matters of the, of the dunya, the Prophet ﷺ didn't have ultimate knowledge. Whereas in the matters of the deen, ultimate knowledge was for Allah's Messenger ﷺ. But I need something more explicit than that. What is something more explicit? Uh, I guess a statement from the Qur'an or a statement from the Prophet ﷺ himself. That when we talk about bid'ah, it's only about bid'ah in the deen and not bid'ah in the dunya. Stick with your Quran and Sunnah. Good, but that's still not explicit enough. That could be deen or dunya. Sorry? Ahsant, yes, continue, right? What did he say? Um, I'm trying to remember the wording. Okay. Ahsant. So hadith number 5 in Imam al is 40. Hadith number 5, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهُ فَهُوَ رَدْ So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, whoever introduces into this affair of ours, meaning this religion of ours, that which is not from it, then it will be rejected. So for the sake of discussion, when the scholars of the past and even present, they speak about bid'ah from, from a worldly perspective or from a cultural perspective, that some bid'ah was needed in order for Islam to advance. That is not to the scope of our discussion, right? Because the Prophet clearly said that the bid'ah that he's referring to that is purely evil, is the bid'ah in our deen. Whereas bid'ah in the dunya, this is weighed in terms of benefits and harms. There are certain innovations that, yes, are, are beneficial for mankind. But there are other innovations that are completely harmful for mankind, right? So it's based upon benefits and harms. Whereas when it comes to bid'ah in this deen, then it is completely forbidden. It is completely hated and disliked. Hated and disliked. So that is, you know, um, addressing what some of the scholars of the past when he said like advancements in, in grammar and like putting the, the dots in the Quran and breaking all, uh, you know, breaking up the verses, that these were all, you know, innovations that were needed. 
these are not particularly religious within of themselves. They're just there to make things easy for mankind. So this is not what the Messenger of Allah was speaking to. Now let's look at the statement of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, that when the Salatul Taraweeh was um, started up again, he said, what a good innovation this is. It's clear over here that Salatul Taraweeh was established during the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That for three nights, the Messenger of Allah, he prayed Taraweeh with the people. And he clearly explained that on the fourth night, he didn't pray with the people out of fear that it would become an obligation upon them. And it would be too difficult for them. So he didn't do this on the fourth night until the end of his life. He didn't continue it again after that. He clearly showed us why. Because he feared that it would become an obligation. But now that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, has passed away, things can no longer become an obligation, right? The deen has been completed. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he revives this sunnah by asking Ubay ibn Ka'ab to lead the people in Taraweeh. By asking the people to lead the people in Taraweeh. And now when he says that what a good innovation this is, this is an innovation not in the Shari perspective. Because the Shari perspective, we said it has to have no foundation in the Quran and the sunnah, when clearly there is a foundation. So what perspective is he speaking from? From a linguistic perspective. That it is something that had been abandoned and now has now become revived. It was something that was abandoned and has now become revived. So that is how it is a good innovation. This is not to show that there is room for good innovations in Islam. There is not to show that there is room for good innovation in Islam. We're going to open up the floor for questions in, in about five minutes inshallah. So let us look at some of the texts that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about the people of innovation. These are actually hadith from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, Inna Allah hajabat tawbata an kulli sahibi bid'atin hatta yada'a bid'atuhu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a barrier in front of every repentance for every companion of innovation until he leaves his innovation. Meaning that the person that is performing bid'ah intentionally, there is no tawbah for him until he leaves that act of innovation. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Abu Allahu an yaqbala amala sahibi bid'atin hatta yada'a bid'atahu. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuses to accept the deeds of a companion of innovation until he leaves his innovation. Meaning that this person upon innovation, Allah will not accept his deeds until he abandons these innovations. These are not statements of the companions. These are statements of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. These are statements of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. So it shows you the severe matter of bid'ah. And if you look inside the tafsir of Surah Al-Kawthar, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on the Day of Judgment, when he's coming to give water with his own hands to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the angels will come and take certain people away. That the Messenger of Allah is trying to give them water from Al-Kawthar and the angels are taking them away. He asks the angels, why are you taking these people away? And the angels tell him, you do not know what they innovated in your religion after you died. You do not know what they innovated in your religion after you died. So this concept of innovation is a, is a very, very serious one and should not be taken lightly. You know, a lot of people think it's just bid'ah, what's the big deal? In religion, it's a very huge deal. That if you look at the way Christianity went astray, it's because they weren't strict on the concept of innovation. That had they been strict on the concept of innovation and you know, re uh, introducing new doctrines and new theologies, that is why they went astray. So in our religion, it is very, very important that we understand that the deen was complete during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and anything pertaining to religion was taught to us then. So if it was not religion then, it cannot be part of the deen now. Very clear to understand that point. Now let me conclude with my last concept, and that is, what are the matters that you can recognize bid'ah in? What are the matters that you can recognize bid'ah in? And there are four main matters that you can recognize bid'ah in. So number one is bid'ah in terms of time. Bid'ah in terms of time. So for example, someone wants to fast Ramadan in terms of Dhul Qiyada. Is this allowed for him? No. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Ramadan clear that the fasting of Ramadan has to take place in Ramadan. You have to try to fast in Ramadan. It's only if you have a valid excuse, then you can fast it in another month. But these are only a short number of days and not the whole month within of itself, right? So that is in terms of general uh, timings that you can look at bid'ah from an aspect of time. So anything that has a specific time frame to it, we're not allowed changing that specific time frame. So if someone wants to change the time from Asia, that we will pray, you know, Maghrib time at the time of Dhuhr, it can't be done. The Sharia has been very specific about timings. 
So that is the first thing. You look at time. Number two, you look at place. That there are certain thing, related things that the religion has sanctioned that those acts of worship can only take place over there. Those acts of worship can only take place over there. So if someone wants to go and perform Hajj you know, in Iran, can they go and perform Hajj in Iran? No, they can't. Even if you set up a fake small Kaaba in your auditorium and start doing tawaf around it, it's not going to be Hajj, right? And that's a real example, by the way. Now, that's actually what they did. They built a fake small Kaaba and they started doing tawaf around it. So, you know, there are certain places that the Sharia has legislated that certain acts of worship can only take place during that time. So that's component number two, time and place. The number three is the way that that act is done. The way that that act is done. So the Sharia has come to show us the way certain actions should be done. Those actions that are restricted need to be followed in a restricted form. Those actions that are not restricted can be done in a general form. So for example, the way the Salah is performed. The Messenger of Allah taught us all the ways that the Salah can be performed. To introduce a new method in performing that Salah would not be allowed. To introduce a new method in performing Salah would not be allowed. But now let's look at something that is general, that is not specific. In terms of dua. So we are allowed to make the du'as the Messenger of Allah made, but we're also allowed to initiate our own du'as, right? Because there's nothing to show that du'a is something restricted. There's nothing to show that du'a is something restricted. So now we have time, place, and methodology. And then the fourth one, and this is something that there's a difference of opinion amongst the scholars on, but we're mentioning it because it is a strong proof, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, had the ability to do something but didn't do it. Something that they were in the religion, that the Messenger of Allah had the ability to do, but he didn't do it. Who can give me an example of something like this? Give me an example of this. So the Kaaba, uh -huh. he, he wanted to rebuild it. Okay. But uh, he also he said to the Aishara, so if you Ummah is not in the close to the Akhira, then I could. That's why I'm not making again. Okay, I think that's too complicated of an example. Let's do something similar, it's easier, simpler. Go ahead. The khuruj. khuruj? Going out for 40 days? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we'll, we'll get to the other examples in a second. I think something even simpler that is more common. What's something that's more common? <coughs> siwak? No, Siwak is from the Sunnah. Siwak is from the Sunnah. The example I'm referring to is the, the Misbaha beads, the beads. Right? The Messenger of Allah had the ability to do using stones, using the, the date pits, like some of the Sahaba did themselves. Yet the Messenger of Allah intentionally didn't do it. And rather he showed us that performing dhikr on your hands is more virtuous because a light will shine from your hands on the Day of Judgment. Right? So this is something the Messenger of Allah had the ability to do, yet didn't do it. And this shows us that it shouldn't be done. Another example of this is on the day of Eid, something that just passed, right? The Messenger of Allah had the ability to pray a lot of rakahs before Salatul Eid, right? He had the ability to pray a lot of rakahs before Salatul Eid, praying nafal prayers. Yet the Messenger of Allah didn't do it, right? So for now someone to say, you know, I want to come and I want to be extra pious, and you know what, I'm going to pray a whole bunch of extra rakahs before the Eid prayer. We say that this is something that is not allowed. Because the Messenger of Allah had there been good in it, he would have showed it to us. He would have showed it to us. Now the foundation of this principle is those three men that came to the Messenger of Allah One said, O Messenger of Allah, you know, I'm going to fast all the time. Another one said that, O Messenger of Allah, yeah, you know, I'm not going to get married. The Messenger of Allah showed them balance and said, look, this religion is a religion of balance. There's a time to get married. There's a time to stay away from your wife, right? Likewise, there's a time to fast. There's a time to break your fast. Likewise with prayer, there's a time to pray. And there's a time for your dunya as well. Everything needs to be done in a balance. So this fourth principle is based upon that. And now I will answer your specific questions, bidnillahi ta'ala, and then we'll give the adhan. Go ahead. So I, I'm not sure, maybe I hear from the the Khulafa Rashidun. Yes. After him, Khulafa Rashidun will be continued 30 years. Correct. Fantastic. So he said that the Khilafa will remain for 30 years, and then after it will be Mulk, after it will be Kingdomship. 
which is when Muawiyah radiallahu anhu took over after that time. Now this hadith does not specifically say that it will be Khilafat al-Rashidah. He just says Khilafah will be for 30 years. And this is like from the foretelling of the Messenger of Allah. Because Abu Bakr was Khalifa for two and a half years. Then Umar radiallahu anhu for 10 years, Uthman for 12 years, and Ali radiallahu anhu for 4 years. Right? This equals 30 at the end. So this is from the foretelling. So this is just to show that Khilafah will last that long for a short amount of time. But it's not to show that this is all, the only Khilafah or Rashidah. So Allah knows best. Next, go ahead. What is required in order for Khilafah to take place? This is a, a, a very you know, intriguing discussion. But what is important to know over here is that the Sharia within of itself did not come with specific guidelines as to how to reestablish the Khilafah. The Sharia came with guidelines how to continue the Khilafah, right? So the most righteous and pious person that the Shura agrees upon, he is meant to be the Khalifa. So this is in terms of the continuation of the Khilafah. Now in terms of restoring of the Khilafah, this is something that is left up to the Ijtihad of the scholars. Now one of the main things that they agreed upon are the characteristics of the Khalifa. That he is someone who should be known to the people for his righteousness, for his knowledge, for his justice, for his wisdom. These are the characteristics and traits of that Khalifa. Where they differed upon is, how do you appoint that Khalifa? Or how do you get everyone to agree upon that Khalifa, right? So I'll, I'll have you know, my choice that I believe X, Y, and Z, he is a good candidate. You'll have your opinion that he's X, Y, and Z. But how do we get these people to actually become the Khalifa? And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But I do not see the Khilafah being restored until the time of the Mahdi. That when the Mahdi comes, everyone agrees upon the Mahdi, even though initially they'll disagree. But everyone will agree upon the Mahdi. And he was the one that will restore the, the Khilafah for us. Because we've seen it ourselves. We cannot decide on when Eid is going to be. We cannot decide when Ramadan is going to begin. How are we meant to decide on one man that's meant to be the leader of the Ummah? Right? So from a st practical standpoint, I don't see it happening till the Mahdi comes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Actually, sorry, can I just add one more thing? And this is like one of the funny things that, uh, you know, when ISIS uh, announced their khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he's the khalifa. This guy is unknown. Who is this guy? You know, where did he come from? No one knew who this guy was. So to appoint someone who is unknown from the, uh, as the khalifa, it goes against one of the very first principles in terms of traits that he has to be known for his knowledge, has to be known for his wisdom and justice. When you have someone that's unknown, it obviously can't apply. I just thought I'd add that in. Go ahead. Yes. And then I just heard uh, somewhere that the, one of the lost uh, Sunnah of Rasulullah that is that is the Tablik Jamal, what they are doing is the lost opportunity to revive it. Okay. So is it... Is so are we talking about the 20 Rakas or are we talking about Jamaat al-Tablik? No, Jamaat al-Tablik is like reviving Sunnah, what I am talking about. Okay. This is what they, they told, that they are, they are reviving the Sunnah of So it's not because lost, so they So the 20 rakahs was lost. <laughs> 20 rakah is not. I'm just, the, the terminology, the reviving the like a Sunnah. So I mean, the reviving of the Sunnah is something which is a, is a known concept, that over time, you know, the Sunnah will be lost, right? Yeah. Their Sunnahs will be lost, this, and it is upon us to revive them. This, uh, So the Jamaat al tabligh is a lost sunnah that is so being... They, 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 they just tell that, okay, where did you get it? So that, uh, that their explanation is this is lost sunnah, people uh, are getting so they are revived. Okay, it's fantastic. So now when you look at this claim, they're saying that it's a lost sunnah that is being revived. We need to see examples of where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's telling the people, go out for three days, go out for 40 days, and go out for four months, right? These are the dates, or these are the days that they specify. We need to find one example of that. When the Prophet ﷺ sent companions, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal an indefinite amount of time. Send Mus'ab ibn Almer an indefinite amount of time. Before he sent these people, he gave them a lot of knowledge to go out and you know, preach to the people. And he also gave them guidelines that, you know, when you will come to a people of the book, that the first thing that you teach them, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they obey you, teach them about the five daily prayers. If they obey you, teach them about zakat. Definite guidelines. When you look at what the Jamaat al tabligh is doing, it is the exact opposite. Any person accepts Islam with them, the next day he's giving a talk about what? Their six principles. 
Right? They have their six principles that they talk about. He's not teaching them about Tawheed. He's not teaching them about Salah. He's not teaching them about Zakah. So on various levels to say that they're reviving a lost Sunnah, I believe is very, very inaccurate. Now this is not to say that the Jamaat al tabliq are bad people. I believe one thing that we can definitely learn from them is their Akhlaq. Their respect for their elders, their love for the Sunnah, their love for coming to the Masjid. These are all very, very good characteristics that we can learn from them. But it is not to show, it is not to say that they are the most perfect group in Islam at the same time. That they do have their deficiencies in them as well. So that's the way we recognize it. To just say all of them is bad, all of them are bad is wrong. To say all of them are good is wrong. But we need to be fair and just and say that the things that are good we accept, the things that are bad we reject. Now as for the issue of the, the 20 rakahs, this is something that the Prophet ﷺ left the door open from. Right? The Prophet ﷺ clearly said, Salatul Layli Mathna Mathna, that the night prayer is two rakahs by two rakahs. Now, what the Messenger of Allah ﷺ did himself was the best example, right? A person prays 11 rakahs, very, very long. Baqarah, Al Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida. You pray like that, pray 11 rakahs, that's perfectly fine. You want to make things easy for the people, keep the rakahs shorter, but increase the number of rakahs. So I don't see anything wrong with praying 20 rakahs, even though I believe that 11 rakahs is closer to the sunnah, but it needs to be prolonged out. Now, looking at our situation in Ramadan being in the summer, you know, you can almost forget about reading Baqarah al-Imran and Nisa in one night. We won't even be able to finish Baqarah in one night. There's not enough time. So I believe, you know, reading shorter salahs is, is much closer to the sunnah, and Allah knows best. Next, we'll take two more questions, inshallah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Hand on the cow. Okay. Okay. This sounds like a Hindu tradition. This doesn't sound like a Muslim tradition. Okay. Okay. Okay, fantastic. So now we're talking about the 15th of Sha'ban. The issue with the 15th of Sha'ban is that there are authentic narrations and there are weak narrations. So let's talk about the authentic narrations. The authentic narrations, they mention that on this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He writes down Qadr on this night. That on this night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives people on this night. Those are the authentic narrations. The weak narrations are that whoever you know, prays this night all night, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him for his sins. Whoever prays this night, then you know, the angels will testify to his righteousness. All of these narrations are weak. So what we need to understand is that even the authentic narrations that are there, they don't indicate that one is supposed to do any extra acts of virtue, any extra, any extra acts of ibadah on that night. But rather they're just there to inform us that this is a night that Allah writes down Qadr on. This is a night that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives people on. They're not there to indicate that one increases in their ibadah. Because if it was meant that people were meant to increase in their ibadah on that night, there would be too many narrations from the companions. And in fact, we don't have any of those, those narrations that they used to increase their acts of ibadah on the 15th of Shaban. So clearly I would say that to specify the night of the 15th of Shaban to do extra acts of worship, then it is better not to do in, in that situation. And Allah knows best. Last question for the night. Yeah, just a general question that I guess is, could answer most of the questions that are coming up today. It's just about the source of knowledge or how to critique what you hear, like you're talking about uh, just rule or unjust rule in, in today's world, we have so much information coming in from different right. sources and you know, about sheikhs which are good or you shouldn't listen to them. So is there a Islamic perspective on how to take in knowledge and how to critically analyze it and accept it? Because Fantastic. Because a lot of these questions that are coming in, oh, is this right, this is wrong, is this right, this is wrong, and it, it causes a lot of confusion. So how do we accept? Fantastic. So from a philosophical perspective, this is what we call epistemology. And epistemology is what you define as the source of knowledge. In Islam, we have three sources of knowledge. 
and the third one is based upon the first two. So there's only three ways of having knowledge in Islam. Either through the Quran, either through the Sunnah, or either through the Ijma' of the scholars. Right? And the Ijma' of the scholars, it has to be based upon either a text of the Quran or a text of the Sunnah. So in retrospect, there's actually only two sources of knowledge, the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that if you hold on to two things after me, you will never go astray. They are the Quran and it is my Sunnah. So whenever we make a judgment upon anything, it will always go back to how did the Quran and Sunnah assess these situations, right? And what does the Quran and Sunnah have to say about it? So the more an individual increases in his knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, the more he has the ability to differentiate between right and wrong. The less knowledge an individual has about the context of the Quran and the Sunnah, the less likely he is able to differentiate between right and wrong. And this is actually a statement of uh, Abdullah bin Umar and other companions. He said that you will never know the truth by the people. That if you keep asking the people, what is the truth, what is the truth, what is the truth, everyone's going to have their own opinions. But he says, if you know the truth, then you will know who its people are. Meaning that if you have knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, then you will know who the people of the Haqq are and who the people of Batil are. So the concept of asking different people for different opinions, it makes it in Islam that has no basis whatsoever. In fact, that's actually discouraged. But rather we're meant to go to the sources of the Quran and the Sunnah and learn them for ourselves and increase our own selves in knowledge and then make judgment upon what is good and bad. Make sense? Yeah, and just in terms of worldly knowledge, like which, when you hear about stuff, about different people, it's hard to verify. Okay, so this is like a commandment in the Quran that in Surah Al-Hujarat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, إِنْ بِنَبِئِن فَتَبَيَّنُوا That if anyone comes, with you, anyone comes to you with information, then always you know, make clarification, always you know, try to authenticate those stories before you make judgment. So as Muslims, we're not meant to just hear and pass on, but rather if you hear something, authenticate it, and if there's benefit in it, pass it on. If there's no benefit in it, then you keep it to yourself. Wallahu ta'ala ala. We'll conclude with that because it's time for a salat al-isha now. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilaik.